tech companies are rolling out new phones and other devices at the Mobile World Congress in Spain, but Google's executive chairman Eric Schmidt is here in Studio 57 with a major announcement about how technology can solve the world's toughest problems. Also with us, Google's Ideas Director Jared Cohen. They traveled to more than 40 countries to see the revolution firsthand. Their book is called The New Digital Age, Transforming Nations, Businesses, and Our Lives. It comes out in paperback next week. Welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, we've got lots to talk about. Let me yeah. just start with this, this sort of connecting the dots. We saw Comcast buy Time Warner in the cable business, giving them the two largest cable systems. Google is in the fiber business, Google Fiber. What's this all about? And are we looking at the competition for the future as to how people will get their internet? Well, we certainly need more comp competition in broadband. And Comcast is the largest footprint. And there's always a concern that the single largest player can get better pricing, and then as a result of better pricing, other people can't enter the market. And that's what everybody's worried about. But then Netflix just signed a deal with Comcast. For well, again, you know, you want to make sure that there's real competition in that market. Google Fiber is a competitor in four of those markets, but not in a lot of the other ones. Mm -hmm. So you're giving away, you're here today for a big announcement. We're very glad you chose us, Eric and Jared. You want to give away millions of do a million dollars to a company or people who are solving problems through technology. What impresses you? What gets your attention, Eric Schmidt? Well, I think, I think at least I should put my money where my mouth is. You know, mm -hmm. the book is about the problems. There's lots of people working on the solutions. We identified a whole mm -hmm. bunch of companies in different parts of the world trying to solve oppressive censorship, empower individuals, and make these phones more useful. Mm -hmm. Jared, I mean, you traveled the world looking for these kinds of things. What did you find? Well, to me, the, the biggest question out there in the future as all these people come online is what happens to dictators and autocrats? They're going to be significantly They're outnumbered. Like Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Ukraine's an example. So Venezuela is an example. We've now moved beyond just the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. uh, as billions of people come online, most of these people are coming online in parts of the world that have autocratic governments. And they're going to be you know, the largest demographic in the world armed with mobile devices and savvy young people. We forget how many billions of people there are that work in places that do not have the liberties of America. Mm -hmm. They want them too, and they're going to use their phones to get them. So what's the connection with Google in that? Well, Google, of course, benefits by connectivity, but Google's mission is to connect the world, right, to get all that information out. We want a free, open internet for every citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. But one of the things you talked about in the book that was so fascinating to me was about terrorism and the, the, the role that technology plays in terrorism. You said 90% of us have our smartphones near us, three feet away from us 24-7. So do the terrorists. And that at some point they will ultimately stumble and fumble because they're communicating with people that are not as tech sa savvy as they are. Right. So it's very difficult to imagine a terrorist in the future operating out of a cave in Tora Bora right. and being even remotely relevant. So every terrorist in the future is going to have to opt into technology. And when they do that, there's going to be a digital trail. Or, or they'll use a courier to heaven, but the exactly. digital trail will they, go but, to the but courier. They, they will be found. You can find them with good, good, good look what happened to Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. And there's a long tradition of terrorists being young, and there's an even longer tradition of young people making mistakes. Yes. So add technology into the mix and it all gets captured. Yes. Let me talk about acquisitions in the technology business. I mean, what do you think of Facebook's newest acquisition for $16 billion? And does this in any way indicate some kind of boom, uh, some kind of, of paying too much and therefore uh, offering problems for the economy? Well, I'm sure it won't affect the economy. The, people have been talking about a bubble in tech for years. Right. The price was low if they make gazillions of dollars off of the kind of customers they're getting. They're getting up to 450 million users, right? So that's highly valuable. Price is too high if they can't monetize it. Did, well, what did Google get in the business? Was Google bidding for What's that? Uh, not, not in the way that you're thinking about. We're certainly aware of them. But Fortune reported that Google was offering about $10 billion for WhatsApp. Let me not talk about the specific conversation with WhatsApp. Let's just say let's just say that we like WhatsApp, but we like some other things too. But, but, but you didn't like it as much as Facebook liked. Let's it. just say we like our own products. <laughs> but, so what happened to Motorola? I mean, here you paid a big price for Motorola and then you sold it for a much less price. Motorola is a huge deal for Google because we got all the patents we needed and we got the ecosystem of Android working. Look today at Mobile World Congress. You see the announcement of Nokia using Android as part of its platform, distancing itself a bit from Microsoft. Android got stronger because of the, the Motorola deal, and it was a very good deal for Google. I'm very, very proud of it. You also t point out in the book, I'm so f I was so fascinated about the double-edged sword of technology. Jared, you have a new baby on the way. Your first baby on the first way. Baby. Congratulations. Gail's a unisex name. Do with that what you will. But you said <laughs> it's gotten to the point 
point where <laughs> we have got to teach our children about how to use the internet, that that is a more important conversation than the birds and the bees. And that really struck me because growing up, we needed to know the birds and bees. What will you teach your, your young baby coming in? Well, I, I think that's precisely right. Kids are coming online younger and faster than any other time in history, and that's true from the United States to Saudi Arabia. So the conversation is relevant at a very young age, and I think the main lesson to teach my future daughter, besides the fact that I'm introducing her digital identity before she's even born Whoa. on this show, um, <laughs> a girl, you know, okay. the, the main lesson is you know, nothing gets deleted once it's, once it's put if, online. If you, if you think about it, this is the first generation where we'll, we'll always have a record from birth of yeah. what they did, all their childhood and baby behaviors. I'm not sure this is such a good thing, but it's certainly going to happen. Mm -hmm. We're on a campaign not to post sonograms before their birth. At least they should give you some kind of acknowledgement mm -hmm. of this. One of the most important things I read last week was mm -hmm. a story about Google and how to get a job at yeah. Google. Yeah. Tom Friedman wrote an entire column about yes. it. Mm -hmm. Tell me the essence of how you get a job and what Google has learned about new employees. What you need most is intellectual flexibility. Over and over again, people, when they do hiring, say, I want a person who did X or Y or Z in their last job. We want people who can deal with the future changes. These businesses change so radically. By the way, it's true in the media industry. It's true in lots of other industries as well. You're much better off selecting for people who are quick enough, right, that they say, OK, there's a new problem. I always believed at Google and still believe that I don't know what the future holds, but I have the right people to help me figure it out. And that should be the primary criteria. So being the smartest person in the class, that's great, but that's not necessarily well, it a turns out, point. It turns out that the smartest people sometimes can't really communicate very well. Oh. And so we actually select not just for intelligence, but also for the ability it's to communicate it. with each other and work as teams. Mm -hmm. Nobody's a solo actor at Google anymore. Yeah. One of the most important things you can have is the ability to communicate. Well, but more importantly, to be able to actually get up, show up at work, communicate with other people, <laughs> get your job done. You mean social you know, skills. So, you social skills. skills. You mean yeah. A Rhodes scholarship does not guarantee that. No, no, no. And in fact, some of our employees are on the edge. But trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Bathing is a good thing, too. Yeah, that, that's a good no, but thing. I, I will, but I, but I, I will tell I will tell you that the quality of the workforce at Google is the best that we've ever seen in tech, and I say really? this with great pride, because we look not just for this intelligence, so but this ability to create and to deal with new ideas. Yeah. Right? There's a new fact. Change your opinion. Here's a new idea. Here's something else mm. happening. The industry happens so fast. Mm -hmm. You have something to say. I was just going to say, you know, Charlie interviewed Bill Murray, fabulous Bill Murray, who said the key to success is being alert and available. Yeah. <laughs> He's right. Yeah. What is the price we pay? You, you mentioned about uh, privacy suffering because of technology. Should we be concerned about losing privacy and, and some sense of security? Well, in the book, we actually say that you should fight for your privacy or you'll lose it because the, the, the governments will naturally react to threats and then they'll put in various forms of surveillance and so forth. In a dictatorship, you could imagine these cameras looking at everything and then calculating what's going on under the rubric of keeping you safe and losing a tremendous amount Speaking of privacy. Speaking of all that, have you changed your opinion about NASA and Edward Snowden, the NSA? Mm -hmm. I don't know that we. I don't well, know. I mean, well, you've been outspoken in terms of, of Google and, and Internet companies and what happened in terms of NSA well, and Edward Snowden well, and it, what he did. Well, first place, Snowden, has, Snowden was helpful in alerting everybody to what the government was up to. Right. We are very clear in the book that we do not endorse individual actors leaking such important information. We don't think people should just do that. But you thought there dangerous. were problems with NSA? Yes, in terms of course. Of what well, they they been, doing. Which, and they've been well documented. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and Charlie, of course, the, the, one of the biggest problems in the future is the ability for an individual to leak in bulk and do so remotely. Yeah. And so we, you know, first it was Manning, then it was Snowden. The reality is we're going to keep seeing more and more of That's these a, individuals. And how, again, this is a new problem, right? The ability to take a single USB card and take a million records of your tax information or your health right. information. So when Governments aggregate that data, it's very important that they either not aggregate the data or they figure out a way that people can't just take it, especially people who are inside. All right, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen, great to have you guys here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Congrats. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>